So welcome to another podcast from Odell Technology today. We're very honoured to be joined by Mr. Morgan Jones from Wales, um, an orthopaedic surgeon. Hello, Reardon. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, Steve. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. I was hoping that you wouldn't mind uh, introducing your professional background and how you ended up where you are today, please. Well, I constantly feel like a bit of a fraud, if I'm honest. I, uh, I'm from the Swansea Valley in South Wales, went to my bog standard comprehensive and uh, against everyone's expectations, not least my own, I ended up in medical school. And that was a huge shock to the system. But through the uh, a lot of hard work, a lot of playing rugby, um, I go out and get them attitude, <laughs> I got through. And um, it's been a pleasure and honor to be a doctor and then from there train as a surgeon. And during the last couple of years in medical school, I was allowed to go on an elective anywhere in the world to, to look at any aspect of medicine or surgery. And I was fortunate to go to Sydney, Australia to work with a huge hero of mine, uh, Mervyn Cross. He's a knee surgeon and I came back uh, enthusiastic about potentially becoming a surgeon and if I'm lucky enough, become an orthopaedic surgeon and then specialising in knees. And over the years, all those things have come true. And uh, I sometimes pinch myself. I'm incredibly lucky to be, you know, what, who I am and, and doing what I do every day. You're now, um, so, um, Rin, where are you working now? Well, that, that's an interesting uh, part of my, my journey. After 22 years working at the University Hospital in Cardiff, becoming a revision knee specialist, providing tertiary services to a large chunk of, of South Wales and the Southwest. Uh, I moved to Colchester in Essex, absolutely the complete opposite end of the country. Um, I retired in part from the NHS in Wales and was just working part time. And I had an opportunity that came my way that I just simply couldn't turn down. Colchester, part of the Ipswich Colchester Trust, have a brand new build, £65 million worth of investment, eight theatres, 50 beds just for planned elective orthopaedic care. And in the post COVID era, having standalone elective units that are not going to be influenced by any external factors, winter bed crises, pandemics, is really the, the future of how the NHS can function in, in the new world. This is interesting. Are you doing anything different in this new in the knee centre now? What are you doing that's unique? Uh, so, th so hopefully it'll be many things. You know, we'll be looking at uh, efficiency of throughput, promoting day case joint replacement surgery, uh, looking at um, advanced practitioner care, training fellowships, a lot of teaching. Uh, uh, literally adjacent to this new building is a state-of-the-art medical education centre. So we're going to be looking at doing live surgeries, education, working with industry, trying to be, uh, I hope, a world-class unit. Are you using any robotic surgery at all? So I'm not, but I have a very good colleague, Tim Parrott, who is a, a real pioneer of, of robotic surgery in the region. And I think with anything that's new and like uh, so advanced, you don't want lots of people doing it. You want one or two key members of staff, colleagues who pioneer it, raise it to the right level. And then you introduce, if I'm honest, younger colleagues. I'm a little old to be changing my techniques now. Uh, I think the learning curve is, is fairly steep. But when you get there, I think there really is and will be advances for patients. So what are the big, what in terms of numbers, what are the big procedures that have to take place in order to reduce the waiting lists in that region? So not just the East of England where I'm working now, but across the NHS, England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland, um, what we're really concentrating on, what will make the biggest difference are the low complexity, high volume operations. So for example, uh, primary knee, primary hip replacements, first time joint replacements. What we need to do is get them through quickly and efficiently. Uh, maybe robotics is a role to play there. And uh, we need to raise capacity. And what we're building in Colchester is a regional unit. There's way more capacity than my colleagues in Colchester alone can use. So we're building this regional unit, bringing in people from uh, West Suffolk, from Chelmsford, Basildon, Southend, um, Berry St Edmunds, we bring in surgeons in with patients to really use the capacity in a way that will be unaffected by, as I said, winter bed crises, the usual pressures on the NHS. And in some ways, that's a return to the past in orthopaedics, at least. We used to have standalone units in the countryside, starting off by managing TB with bed rest, fresh air therapy, 
and those evolved into the first generation orthopedic units. And there was a big closing uh, down of these units in the 80s and 90s, and now we're reinventing them because that's what you need in a health service. You need that uh, flexibility in the healthcare economy where you can do electives, standing alone, do the trauma, do the emergencies, do the, uh, the winter pr uh, pressures elsewhere. Are you using any patient reported outcomes in this exercise? That's a really good question. I think the big advance in what we've done in, in surgery in general, certainly orthopedics over the last maybe 10, 15, 20 years, is that we've stopped thinking it's about us, the surgeon. You know, how good am I? Look, look at how, how, my, how wonderful my operations are. We may have great looking x-rays, good operations, but are they working for patients? And orthopedics really has pioneered, pioneered uh, patient outcomes because we want to know if the job we're doing is it effective, is it a low complication rate? Is it giving pain relief, return of function, independence back to patients? And I think that's been foremost in, in us changing our philosophy over the last couple of decades. It's about the patient. Oh, I'm pleased to hear you say that. I, I know that in um, I've, I've been fortunate enough to work to, to, to visit a number of orthopedic centres in France and Germany and Australia. And I know that their Care Quality Commission or their equivalent of the CQC have introduced patient reported outcomes as a care quality initiative. And I think the CQC is going to do the same in the next few years. Yeah. Well, look, there's, there's no doubt, you know, in some ways we've pioneered, pioneered outcomes and, and results with the National Joint Registry, for example. That's a world leading registry. Yeah. Uh, we've corrected problems for, for many years, but I think it's moving on to the next level. And um, one of the interesting things we're doing in Colchester, again, through my colleague Tim Parrott, is working with um, Smith & Nephew and a company called Humor, which be collecting real-time data of patients about uh, their movement, their activity level, how they're functioning before and after joint replacement, just to make sure that we're actually giving a benefit to patients. These are expensive operations and we've got to do them well, but improve patient li life afterwards. Are you doing anything in pre-operative assessment? So that's one of the um, the main agendas that I have going forwards because um, I spend a lot of my time as a revision knee surgeon. I'm unpicking problems, uh, infections, wound problems, things that haven't worked despite often technically good operations. And the the big advance I think going forwards in outcomes I think is before surgery. It's optimization. It's the pre-assessment. It's saying to patients, look, you know. We're going to put you forward to surgery, but we're not going to operate until your BMI is down, until your blood sugars are right, until your anemia is corrected, until other factors actually will mean your complication rate is lower, but actually your activity level will be higher and you make greater use of whatever operation we give you, a new knee, a new hip. You want to be fit to use them. So I think we need to look not just about outcome after surgery, but what we're doing before the operation to improve the patient, to reduce complications, yes but make sure they're fit enough to enjoy the outcome of surgery. And I think that's also true of the anaesthetist as well. They're hoping to do some preoperative assessment that, that's meaningful as well. Absolutely. And sometimes it has to be a discussion because you can have patients that have um, pre-morbid conditions that you can optimise, you can make better. Sometimes you just can't. And then you've got to weigh up, look, if this patient is more, has as many um, comorbidities, chest problems, heart conditions, but a new neo new heap will give them independence back, will increase their activity level, will get them out of the house. You've got to weigh up the risk and benefit. And that's often uh, an individual risk assessment. We need to do things efficiently so we, we care for the most quickly and efficiently and safely. But once in a while, anaesthetists, surgeons, nurses, pharmacists, when you sit down and do an MDT and give individualised care to patients. Right, so we've talked about, are you doing any research at the centre right now? No, not yet. I mean, there are individual projects up and running, but we've got a couple of publications in our belt. But in terms of long-term studies, I think that's things that will set up. And likely they'll come to fruition after I've retired. But uh, we're certainly involved with doing a little bit. And recently I was speaking to colleagues at the University of uh, East Anglia, Norwich. I have good colleagues up there, and we're going to collaborate with some infection-based studies. Oh, excellent. OK, so is that to do with surgical side infections, post-operative infections? Absolutely, yeah. So it's a small risk, but when it happens for the patient, it's devastating. So as surgeons who implant metal, polyethylene, synthetic materials in the body, 
we've got to do it in a sterile environment and we've got to reduce the risk of infection. No surgeon, no hospital has a zero infection rate. I, I wish, but we should be as close to that as we possibly can. And that's again, patient optimization, but it's also researching why infections happen and how we can avoid them. Are you using any new orthopedic technology that, that, that people may not be aware of at this point in time? So a lot of my work is in managing the problem, managing joints that have got infected. So from my perspective, some of the new technologies we're doing are non-antibiotic antibacterials. So for example, for years, I've written and lectured on the use of acetic acid vinegar yes. as a cleansing agent. And we published a, a good paper on that a few years back, and that worked very well. And now industry has got wind of this, and there actually there are a couple of products coming to market, some there already, which is acetic acid, plus a couple of other chemicals joined together, produced in, at an industrial level that we can then use to wash out an infected joint. And yes, we'll still use antibiotics, but if all we do is rely on antibiotics, we're just going to get more resistance, more failures. So we've got to help antibiotics work better for us. And that means using different techniques, different antibacterial techniques. Okay, the lavage is interesting. I've heard, I've heard yeah. of a couple of centres doing that. That's a wonderful idea. Mm. So have you made an impact at this point in time? Ah, oh, <laughs> I hope it's a good impact. But um, yeah, I've um, my first project when I was there was to um, complete the application for major revision centre for knees. And there's a, a national programme in England. Uh, the east of England had one centre already in Norwich. Uh, they were looking for the second centre. And uh, it was a straight uh, shootout between ourselves and Cambridge and I was leading the Colchester bid, put that together and we were very su we were successful. Literally about f six weeks back we had the uh, the bid acknowledged and we're successful and that brings in funding to set up uh, the centre but it means then we run our region in terms of organising um, work with colleagues to bring complexity into the centre so the low volume, high complexity cases come into the middle where the expertise is. And then you work in a network with other units where they'll be doing other revisions, complex case, but just not the big salvage cases. And the big the big change for us has been uh, the development of network MDTs, so multidisciplinary teams. And in a, any region, if you're going to do a revision knee now, you have to discuss it regionally so that surgeons, one, are supported to make good decisions patients get the right operation in the right hospital by the right surgeon. And there's a, an almost dreadful statistic that um, the most common number of revision knees done per surgeon per hospital per year is one. And the second most common is two. So you have a lot of very good surgeons doing operations that they're not terribly familiar with. And it doesn't matter who you are, you know, if I did something I haven't done for 20 years, I'm not going to be good at it. So we're encouraging patient movement into the center or into the, the regional network so that we encourage more surgeons to do greater volume and to do it with colleagues and to do it in, in their hospitals, but also do it with colleagues in the region through MDT discussion. And we're trying to build that network so patients benefit again. Okay, that's rather interesting. You also talked about education. And this is education of surgeons or yeah. of multidisciplinary teams? A bit of both, but uh, primarily surgeons. Um, you know, it's surgeons in terms of sometimes what the operation should look like, what the proper planning should be, which implant will work for which problem, but also education uh, of surgeons and colleagues within an MDT setting. So we'll do an MDT not just with surgeons, but with wound care practitioners, anaesthetists, orthogeriatricians, pharmacists, uh, microbiologists. So we're trying to spread that load, get as much input as possible so we can give the best advice. And education is very much a two-way thing. And, you know, I, I do an awful lot of lecturing nationally and internationally, but every time I talk, every time I'm on uh, a faculty, I learn something of other faculty, of delegates asking me questions. And the same thing happens when I'm in a room with a pharmacist or a wound healing nurse or a microbiologist. They'll suddenly come up with something that I just hadn't thought of, or they'll quite rightly correct me when I'm talking rubbish, which I do sometimes. The other thing that, that's uh, busy in my life at the moment is the Bone and Joint Infection Society. So we've got together as a team to build a society that is not just surgeons talking about surgery, but we work with microbiologists and uh, wound healing nurses and pharmacists again, and scientists, so that we're all 
talking about infection in open forum. We have an annual meeting. We do web webinars. And ultimately, we hope to publish guidelines that will help our profession. Oh, that's exciting. OK, mm. so we're talking about national guidelines coming out of your centre. Uh, or not just my centre, the Bone and Joint Infection Society is a national group with members from Wales, Scotland, England, all over the place, and encouraging international membership as well. And at all levels, trainees, consultants, and across the healthcare profession, because again, together, we are much, much better treating patients. And honestly, the infected joint replacement is a real burden for the patient. It's really hard for the surgeon as well. There's a lot of guilt that comes along when one of your operations hasn't worked. And sharing that burden, sharing that load, is healthier for the surgeon in terms of them managing their case mix and their workload. But patients get better care afterwards as well. So, Ridden, I'm going to come, I want to come back to you in another four months and have another talk to you about where you are with the project. I yes. think this is a very exciting project. I, 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 like the I like the description you said about this. I like the description you gave about returning to the past. I think that actually is quite a meaningful yeah. comment. Yeah, and and I, I, I'm, I'm, absolutely. I'm, learning from our predecessors. And, uh, you know, I think the every mistake I've ever made, my predecessors made before me. And, and I'm just... <laughs> too stupid I've picked it up beforehand you know and what I really want no. now is, is to pass on to my peers and my next generation colleagues what I've learned literally by working and occasionally having to unpick my own matters yeah. we're better as a team aren't we we're always definitely better as a team. definitely all right well I want to thank you very much for your time today it's been fabulous to talk to you pleasure and um, it's been very kind of you to give me your time